Welcome to American Front Porch, Mid-Americana and Acoustic Traditions with Swamp Weiss and Video Bob Whiteside. We've been on the internet for, you know, over 10 years, probably closer to 15, but we just started uh, producing these uh, podcast shows, which feature some of the performers that we've recorded, we've done video music videos for uh, for many years, but uh, this way we get to interview the performer and uh, talk about what they're doing and about their music a little bit and uh, hopefully introduce more people to some of these rare individual types. So uh, here, uh, here he is in person. This is Hobo Jack, who formerly known as Backwoods Jack, who was also known as Jack Sofer. <laughs> uh, so tell me, Jack, why do they call you Backwoods? Well, it's pretty easy. I live in the backwoods. Yeah. Okay, well that solves that mystery. Um, I, I think, you know, let's face it, people have seen you on television. They've seen you on, on American Pickers. Uh, Mike Wolf uh, has, uh, we, we did a little video with Mike Wolf where he points out that you're probably the most popular person that they've dealt with on that show. Probably, I don't know why. But, uh... Oh, come on, I mean, it's, um, you're, you're an interesting fella. Uh, you know, I, I think that we Jack recently was covered in a cover story for a local um, regional magazine, and they tended to romanticize Jack a lot more than he really is. I mean, Jack really is a, a down-to-earth, uh, I mean that in the most literal sense. <laughs> he spends a lot of time crawling around in the mud trying to fix cars and stuff. So, I mean, Glamour is not your middle name. <laughs> Well, that's certainly a, an accurate description. Yeah, um, although you're not you're not actually a hobo. You were you were a traveler and an itinerant and, a, and an orchard worker and doing uh, odd jobs and and so forth. So you really do know some stuff about that, don't you? Well, I for the first fifteen years after I got out of school, I spent much of my time traveling around from one place to another doing odd jobs and I would never have called myself or thought of myself as a hobo if somebody had asked me I would have said well I'm a, a drifter and then about uh, 17 years ago when I first went up to Britt, Iowa to the National Hobo Convention and I got to talking to some of the older hobos and found out how they had lived, I, real, I began to realize that I had been a hobo and didn't even know it. Well, uh, as uh, there's a documentary, documentary that some uh, California kids uh, put together about the disappearing, uh, the death of the American hobo. And interestingly enough, they used Jack's photograph to promote the, the YouTube video, and Jack's not in it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, they use your picture to, to promote their documentary, which is just like about 25 minutes long. And then you're, you don't show up in the, in the documentary. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, that. I guess they think you're photogenic or something. I don't know. I don't know. I uh, my uh, my picture seems to sh turn up in odd places. Uh, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> like like for instance, today we're in the Wayside Antique Mall, uh, which is you know between Greenville and Hillsboro, Illinois, on Route 127. And Jack is now uh, one of the proprietors here at this mall, and what you're looking at here is some of Jack's stuff. I won't say junk because this is, you know, well, they're, is, they're collectibles and they're antiques. And, yeah, and and some junk, a little, sort of, kind of, maybe I don't know. 
But you, you really, um, I, I wanted to talk with, with you about this. Um, one of the things that you and I had in common was a knowledge of St. Louis junk dealers. And, and you, after all, you started off as, a, as just a, a back alley picker, you know, just... That's true. You, you, you know, so it's, it's like, if somebody is throwing away something that you see some value or some use in, it's not essential that it's an antique, you know, necessarily. You're, you know, Jack's place, I think you've seen it on television. Well, the building's full of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's not necessarily and, antiques. You know. and, and a great deal of it did come out of the alleys in St. Louis. Yeah. But, That's uh, like 35 or so years ago. Yeah. And uh, it, we found out, we figured out, uh, after we started uh, talking a bit uh, years ago, that we both knew had been to the Sanford's junk store in St. Louis. There actually was a Sanford's junk store in St. Louis, a that's, great, that's great junk store. At, at Shoto and Vanavetter, uh, which back in the day was just across the, the road from the slaughter yards, you know, where they, and it didn't smell good there in the summer times, uh, but it was a great junk store. And uh, it, was a, it was a couple of uh, uh, interesting, what was it, brothers? Uh, no, it, actually, Sanford was the son. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, you know, the, the famous story is that, is that they sued Red Fox over the use of the name Sanford and Son, and they lost. Because as it turns out, everybody just, Red Fox was from East St. Louis, and everybody assumed that he had stolen the name Sanford and Son from Sanford's junk store. But uh, I believe the way that turned out was that, that Red Fox actually had a great-grandfather or somebody named Sanford. And so that guy that, that basically got him off the hook, I think, out of that lawsuit. But they were nice old guys. I used to go in on my lunch hour, and, and uh, I worked close by, and um, go in there and spend time with, with that junk store. Well, the father was a little hard to deal with. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Sanford, the son, is the one that took over, and he's the one from whom I bought most of my uh, items from. And I bought a lot from him over the years. Yeah, yeah. You could. There's no way you could walk in that place and not find something for five or ten bucks that you just had to have. You know. Was, he had a a uh, a tomb-like labyrinth underneath the uh, first the the, the main, the main store. store. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I hesitate to call it a cellar because it wasn't really a cellar in the in the normal sense, but it was a, a group of tunnels that <laughs> someone had dug in underneath the floor, and they were all filled sometimes with very fascinating uh, antiques, and hardly anyone ever went down there because it was like a dungeon. Yeah, yeah, I think I made it down there one time, and I, I was lucky to get out alive. I, it really... Um, Man, but the, here's the whole thing. Back in the day, and I'm talking all the way up until the mid-1970s, perhaps, there were junk stores. And anymore, yeah, it's just hard to find them. People go to auctions for that sort of thing. Maybe you see some of it, but it's usually really overpriced. And um, But I understood what Jack was up to when I went to his place. I realized that 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 is where Jack was coming from, you know, essentially was, uh, you know, being a, a junk picker. And uh, then, then we both had met Zeno, who is, talk about another unique individual. Uh, he was the junk man in this uh, historic Soulard part of St. Louis. And we had both had dealings with him over the years. Oh, I, I, I remember Zeno very fondly. He was a very oh, nice... He, oh, he was a, a nice man, but watch out for the Bowie knife. <laughs> you know, these guys that live on the street, uh, they realize that there's an inherent risk in going around through back alleys, digging through people's stuff. And, and uh, you know, especially if you make it over into uh, East St. Louis, uh, 
that's a kind of risky area, but you know, you, you go where the junk is. But uh, anyway, Zeno was a fascinating guy. He was a president of the Robert, you know, Jack's a poet. And Zeno, for instance, was a member of the, the Robert, uh, or the uh, uh, Robert Burns Society in St. Louis. And uh, was the uh, librarian for the Masonic Library. And uh, he had been a, uh, an OSS uh, secret agent in World War II, and that Zeno was his code name. Anyway, we're talking about so junk men in general are, are are a certain fascinating type American character that's vanishing just as much as the hobo. So you kind of hiss your caboose to the vanishing junk business, as well as the vanishing hobo business, didn't that's, you? Wow, that's terrible. Yeah. Well, um, you're you're kind of sort of starting to uh, dissolve some of your inventory out there here. Uh, that's, uh, the problem for me has been that the buildings were not airtight, they were not sealed up against the weather, and the humidity is so terrible where I live that it has really destroyed a high percentage of the furniture type pieces that were in there. Yeah. So I've been pulling things out and letting them go at auctions and to, to uh, one of the uh, architectural, architectural antique dealers in the area, Mark Brazel, and some of it, when it's in too bad a condition, it just goes into the kindling wood pile. Yeah, I, I've seen uh, seen some sad stories out there, but I mean, that's let's face it, that's part of a, a general American problem, where um, some of the world, some of the very very valuable American collectibles have ended up out in the southwestern United States, out in New Mexico and Arizona, in vast warehouses, kind of like Area 51, where they store all the used flying saucers. Uh, but at any rate. Uh, there's buyers that come through the Midwest. They come all the way from the East Coast. They buy antiques at places like this, the Wayside Antique Mall on Route 127. And they, they, um, they come by and they fill up vans and trucks and take the stuff out to California and, and Arizona and uh, you know, give it dry stories. You know, so it's, it's kind of a, an American geographical reality. You know. Now, let's say, why is Jack doing this? Because he basically hangs on to stuff until it either rots or he sells it for a decent amount of money. And, but you're trying to sell off so that perhaps in, in, when you get to be an old guy, that you can, <laughs> that you can retire out and maybe get closer to your, your daughter. Jack's daughter is a wonderful gal, and she lives all the way out in California. So he's, he's kind of trying to uh, get a grub stake to go out there. Well... Where I, where my daughter is living in San Francisco, to buy any kind of a uh, decent piece of real estate, you have to be a multimillionaire, and I'm still working on my first million, and I, I probably got about nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety dollars left to go, but I got that first ten dollars set aside. Yeah, and if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's it Jack's just like you know everybody. It, it, it's it's a cash flow you know solvency issue more than anything else. But uh, at any rate, he uh, he started performing many many years ago. Uh, when and that's something I, I'm not clear on. I know that you you grew up in the the University City area, which is is now a mecca for for music. Uh, it's in the area of Washington University in St. Louis. And for instance, Chuck Berry performs there. He's a regular performer there, uh, close to where Jack came from. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite well known for music these days. But back when you got interested in music, uh, there was this, this Gaslight Square. Was that your first? That was my first introduction to folk music. Gaslight Square was in its heyday. Mm -hmm. and wow. And that was quite a heyday for about oh, five to seven years. Uh, 
the, the real peak years were maybe three or four years. There were about three or four yeah. peak years. That, it was actually mm. on Olive Street, on the, on the part of Olive Street that was known as Antique Row. Yeah, right. Yeah. Gaslight was a, was a beautiful thing. It celebrated all kinds of musical heritage and traditional music. I, I feel mm. very fortunate that I was able to meet and get to know uh, Judy Collins and Bonnie Dobbs. Oh, you got to meet Judy Collins? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'd remember um, that, too. She played there for uh, a couple of weeks, and, and I got to know her pretty well. And Bonnie Dobson and Carolyn Hester, she was there. Um, and then, of course, you're, you met your mentor there, uh, you know, uh, with the... Uh, well, Pat Webb, who, yeah. who was the, the uh, uh, blues instrumentalist who really taught me my guitar styling was uh, around Gaslight for quite a long time. There was Frank Moskus. Did you ever go there? I re yes, I remember Frank Moskus. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, the, the bartenders in Gaslight Square were, were probably just became sort of celebrities the way you are now. They, you know, Frank Moskus as, as a bartender and the bartender at the Crystal Palace was this guy with a photographic memory that was a a, a famous uh, conversationalist, but uh, yeah, so the music scene there was really good. Pat Pat was performing there, and you observed what he was doing, and he actually showed you some things. Pat Pat Webb showed me the uh, style of picking that I do, and he was doing one song which I really liked, and it was extremely difficult. And I had just gotten my first guitar. What kind was it? Oh, I don't know. A classical or a, was it a classical neck like no, this one? No, it was an antique guitar. Oh, really? Yeah. Like a parlor guitar? I don't, I don't I think I paid twenty dollars for it. But uh, I watched Pat Webb do uh, Sitting on Top of the World and I thought I've got to learn to do that. Uh, it's one and of the greatest songs of all a time. Very, yeah. very difficult version of it that he was doing. Now he and learned Pat, that version from Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. Very likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, Pat Webb actually toured with Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, the famous old uh, and uh, Pat, folk and, blues performers. And Pat was so patient with me. I could hardly play the guitar at all. But he would sit there night after night showing me exactly the fingering and how to press on the string. And how to Life's a long Places that I seen, summer, swamp, winter, lane. Don't you know a witch that I could go back home? I don't know why I left, but it's always on my mind. I ask the only questions I can find. Is the old town still the same? Does anybody know? But Pat really never cashed in much. Uh, no, he didn't. And he should have because he was one of the world-class musicians of his. Yeah, yeah, he, he really is pretty highly thought of. His, uh, you know, he, I think his recordings, I think there's a recording of his in the Library of Congress that's a, a pretty famous uh, historic recording at this point. It was a sad yeah. day when I, uh, recently when I found out that he had passed away. Just just last uh, August, yeah. In the August, last August. Yeah. Um, his son is, is quite a fabulous guitar player, and we haven't been able to track him down. But this, the quote folk music thing sort of became a cliche, and people made fun of it. And um, 
I don't know, Jack's, Jack's kind of a holdout. He, he still <laughs> kind of thinks of himself as a folk music musician, I think. Uh, there are still a few of us around who are basically folk musicians. And, uh, and then I've, I spent a lot of time uh, writing four or five books over the last few years. Boy, so, have you ever, you know. The, Lots of time. Uh, the, two, the two main ones are the, uh, the two Tramp Prince books that are at the publisher now. Just okay, waiting. well tell us what, exactly what the titles of these books are. Well, one of them is called... The first one. The first one is, the, is Amazing Adventures of the Tramp Prince. And then the second one, which is a sequel, is called More Amazing Adventures of the Tramp Prince. Strangely enough, yeah. yeah. Well, well uh, you could have called it more of the same, I suppose, but I mean, it's, uh, what, what's, what's different it's, about uh, the two books? Well, there's one is a continuation. The, uh, the, the theme of the, of the books is that there is a family of homesteaders who have been squatting on the uh, property of a, an unknown owner for 20 years in a uh, uh, run-down building that they've renovated uh, in a very remote area, in a wooded area, and the man finally comes and uh, orders them to leave their home because he wants to move into it. It's such a beautiful place. Hmm. And so the, uh, the son is uh, 18 years old, and this is in 1911. Wow. And so he begins traveling around the uh, country looking for another abandoned farmstead or homestead for his family. Wow. And it's the adventures that he has and the different people that he meets. Wow, that sounds really the theme, interesting, Jack. Theme of, of the book. The displaced, uh, you know, and that'll hit home today with people uh, being foreclosed on because of the, the recession a few years ago. I just found out two days ago one of my good friends is, is being foreclosed on, losing his house they, next month. You know, they're, they're kicking him out on January 1st in the cold. I mean, literally tossed out in the cold, you know. It's a good old Citibank. Let's do a plug for Citibank. Yay. Uh, you uh, built uh, what you sometimes, you, you used to call it a house, and maybe somebody once called it a cabin, but it's, at this point, it's, what is it? It is a shack. It is a shack, yeah. <laughs> it's... Time to get back to the shack, Jack. That's, that's an old jazz line, remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, anyway, uh, we're looking forward to your books. I mean, I can't believe this. I have seen his book, a giant book of poetry called Obscure Ponderings. And then he's, he wrote a sequel to that called Obscure Wanderings. The guy is, you know, I mean, the guitar, the hat, the, the, the junk, all of that. For, for all of that, this man is a writer. Okay, more than anything else, and uh, it's I can't wait for these things to to actually get released. So I, I hope you manage to pull that off this year. Well, there, the two novels are only awaiting the final copy editing, editing, and then my final proofreading. Well, that could take several years. I think it already has taken five years <laughs> because he was at that point like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're still angry. those of us that know about it are still very anxious. Um, the man writes good poetry. I will vouch for his poetry. I have seen that, and uh, you you just find you, really you wouldn't believe how good it is. So um, let's see what else do we need to talk. Well, Jack has a has a wonderful daughter. We mentioned that that he's trying to to move closer out there if he can, and uh, so we we encourage uh, everybody to. Uh, Buy some Hobo Jack stuff uh, from the mall here, or to uh, to look him up online and set up a meet or something like that. Um, 
but uh, we we would like to see him uh, in uh, you know living under a nice warm trestle out in California or something. Yeah, <laughs> some find some domicile out there in sunny California. Uh, I guess we better wrap this up. Do you want do you want to play a song to play us out, Jack? Um, yeah. I'll do a Jimmy Rogers tune. Everybody likes. Oh no no no! You're not going to yodel, are you? You are you? This Jimmy Rogers songs, you know, that involve yodeling, and if possible, in a Hawaiian guitar, which makes even less sense. I got a guy go. and I give her presents by the door. Got me a guy, give her presents by the score. No matter how many presents I give to her, she's always home. Look out, he's gonna yodel now. Yodel. Oh. Okay, well, I think it's a good time to end the show now, and uh, we should have ended it about a minute ago, uh, before the yodeling started for the third time. Um, anyway, this is American Front Porch. We miss our, our pal Swamp Weiss, who, who couldn't make it today, and uh, we will have him back for the next podcast out of that. So we'll see you next time. you have anything else to say, Jack? Well, I think we've said it all. Life's a long, lonesome load Rolling down this eastern road All along every mile as I may roam All the places that I've seen Summer, swamp, winter, rain Don't you know I wish that I could go back home I don't know why I left But it's always on that's the only question I can find Is the old town still the same? Does anybody know my name? Here's the car Like numbers on an endless highway